In this video, I'm going to go, be going over the sort of the basics of genetics, and we actually call this Mendelian genetics. It's called Mendelian genetics because it's named after the fellow that was sort of the, the one that found out some of the vital information that allowed us to understand how traits are passed from parents to offspring. Remember, these notes are going to go on page 29 in your notebook. Now we've been talking a little bit about how traits are passed from parent to child or offspring. The question is, you know, from way back, are the traits that come from each parent blended together in the offspring or is there some other pattern to inheritance? And this question was answered by a monk, actually a monk, in the 17th century and his name was Gregor Mendel. So it's his name, Mendel, that gives us the name Mendelian genetics, which is the way that we understand how traits are passed from one, from parent to offspring. Here's an image of Gregor Mendel, and he lived between 1822 and 1884. He was a monk in Austria, and um, he worked in the gardens of the monastery, and he did all of his work studying pea plants. Okay, here are the pea plants. And they grow something like this, the flowers. And he did numerous studies, many, many studies, of uh, the inheritance patterns of his peas. He would, he would purposefully breed the peas a certain way. And he discovered a lot of very important things that we now understand for genetics. Here's what Mendel discovered. He bred pea plants, like I said, and he discovered that if he bred two pure strains... Okay, these are strains of peas that always had the same trait. Um, if he bred two different pure strains, he did not get a blending of traits, and he was surprised by this. Instead, he found out only one of those traits would show in the offspring. So let's talk about some examples. So for example, he might have bred <clears throat> the purple flower plant and the white flower plant, each of them pure. That is, when you keep on breeding purples, they always get purple, and they keep on breeding whites, and they always get white. But you cross the purple with the white, you would expect to see maybe a lavender color, some kind of a pink maybe, but you got all purple in the next generation. This first generation we call the P generation for parental. The second generation we call F1, stands for filial, which means brother. And if you, in the, in the net generation, the filial generation, you breed two of these together, you get this strange thing where you have three with one trait and the fourth one will be the other trait. So you get three purple and one white in this case. And this is our F2 or second filial generation. So this surprised Mendel and for a long time it surprised everyone else as well. So what we now understand is that the trait that showed up in the offspring was dominant. Okay, this doesn't mean a stronger trait or a better trait or a more common trait even. It just means that it's the one that shows. It's represented when we do genetic studies with a capital letter. I'm using an A here. It might have been any letter, but usually you, you choose a letter that corresponds to whatever the trait is, so maybe a P for the purple flower. And then the trait that disappears and then reappears in the next generation, we call the recessive trait. And this doesn't mean that it's weaker or less common um, or worse in any way. It just means that it disappears in some generations. We represent this one with a lowercase letter. That's the same letter as the dominant. So we could use A's in this case. That's just an example. Now, inheritance, we know now... Um, happens by the passing on of genes which are on chromosomes. So the genes are a piece of chromosome. For every trait, there are two copies of the gene. One of those copies came from the mother and one from the father. One from your mother and your genes and one from your father. These two copies of a gene are called alleles of a gene. Alleles. The allele that always shows we, is, we call the dominant allele, and the allele that sometimes hides we call the recessive allele. So each individual is going to have two alleles for each gene. We call this the genotype. Genotype. Okay, that's the two alleles that you get for, for that gene. If an individual has two dominant alleles, so both of the alleles that they have for that gene are dominant. We call that homozygous 
dominant, and we represent it with two capital letters. If you have two recessive alleles, so both of the alleles that you got from your two parents are recessive, we call that homozygous recessive. Homozygous means two of the same. And in this case, you represent it with two of the lowercase letters because you have both lowercase. And finally, you could potentially have one dominant and one recessive. So maybe you got a dominant from your mother and a recessive from your father or the other way around. And if you have that, we call that heterozygous. And you represent that with a capital and a lowercase. So let's look back at our P example. In this case, we have our true breeding or our pure breeding purple flower. It should be represented by two capital letters because it's homozygous dominant. And then we have our white, our white flower. Um, it was also pure breeding or true breeding. Um, and we represent it with two lowercase p's. It's homozygous recessive. So these were our two um, parentals. And then all of the offspring in that first generation, the filial, first filial generation, were heterozygous. They all had a capital and a lowercase because um, the purple flower donated the capital and the white flower donated the um, lowercase. And you end up with all of them looking purple because they have the capital P. Whenever you have the capital P, that's the one that shows. In this case, it's purple flowers. Okay, so let's look again at our, at our example. We have our parental generation. The purple flower had the two capitals, the white flower the two lowercase. In that first filial generation, they're all heterozygous, having one of each, capital and lowercase. And then now let's look what happens. In the second filial generation, we have, remember we had three purple and one white, which seemed strange, but now when you look at it, this is what this is what you get. You get two of the heterozygous, which show purple because um, the recessive is going to hide if the dominant is there. And then we have one white, which received the two lowercase p's, and one that's homozygous receiving the two uppercase or capital P's. Okay, so just to reiterate, if an individual is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, it will show the dominant trait. We call this the phenotype, the phenotype. So either, if you have any dominant allele, you will show the dominant phenotype. In our example, it was purple flowers. The only way an individual will show the recessive trait is if it is homozygous recessive, having both recessive alleles. Okay, so you're going to show the recessive phenotype if you're homozygous recessive only. So here's an example for eye color. Although eye color is more complicated than this, we can think about it simply as um, blue eyes being recessive, as shown here, and brown eyes being dominant. So in this case, this individual with brown eyes here could have the heterozygous genotype or the homozygous dominant genotype, and either way it will show the brown eye phenotype. On the other hand, if the individual has the genotype of homozygous recessive, having the two lowercase b's, it will show the blue eye phenotype. Okay, bear with me just a little bit more, and we're going to talk about making predictions about the outcome of genetic crosses. Now you have the information you need to be able to predict the outcome if you know the genotype. And it's all based on probability. So this is going to seem like math class for a minute. Each parent, remember, is going to donate one of two alleles, and each offspring is going to receive one allele from mom and one allele from dad. And it's all based on probability, just random chance. So, for instance, if parent one is homozygous dominant, we're using um, Fs to represent flowers in this case, um, and parent two is homozygous recessive, then parent one could donate either this capital F or this capital F. That's all it can donate to its offspring. Parent two can only donate the two lowercase Fs. And now when you combine them, these are our parsable gametes, by the way, 
When you combine them, one from parent one, one from parent two, the offspring is going to be heterozygous. One from parent one, one from parent two, heterozygous. One from parent one, one from parent two, heterozygous. One from parent one, one from parent two, heterozygous. In this case, the only possibility in the offspring is going to be red flowers and heterozygous. Now we usually put this into something called a Punnett square. You may have heard of it before. You may have uh, done this before, but if not, listen up. A Punnett square is a tool that's used to make predictions from known genetic crosses. So those gametes we talked about before that come from each parent. For instance, this maybe is mom and her alleles, and this maybe is dad over here. Okay, we're talking about pea plants, so it's not really mom and dad, but you can think about it that way. So in this case, mom is heterozygous, dad is also heterozygous. They can donate the capital or the lowercase, depending. And in order to figure out the probabilities, we draw this square, and then we just simply add the two alleles together. So this plant received a capital and a capital, and we write that here, it's homozygous dominant. This plant received capital and lowercase, it's heterozygous. Again, purple flower though. This plant here received a capital from mom and a lowercase from dad and is also a purple plant. And finally, this white flower is homozygous recessive because it received two recessive alleles, one from mom and one from dad. So this uh, Punnett square here shows you why it is that Mendel saw three purple flowers for every one flower, one white flower, um, when he did his second generation, because this is exactly his experiment. So you have a three to one ratio in the phenotype, and actually the genotype, you have one homozygous, one, I'm sorry, one homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive, and two heterozygous. So that's it for this one. We went a couple of minutes um, longer than I wanted to, but we're going to be practicing a lot with these Punnett squares in class, and I wanted you to understand it.